a Genoese, the captain of a merchant ship armed for the King of France against the English, carried a shield on which was depicted a bull's head. A French nobleman saw that coat of arms, which he claimed as his own. An altercation ensued and the Frenchman called out the Genoese. The latter accepted the challenge and arrived on the ground without any show, while his foemen came with a grand display of magnificence. Well, inquired the Genoese, what is it we are going to cross swords about today? I assert, replied the Frenchman, that those insignia of yours were mine and my forefathers before even being in your family. Very good, retorted the first speaker. But what are they? A bull's head, was the reply. In that case, we have nothing to fight about. For mine are not a bullock's, but a cow's head. Thus was the Frenchman vainglory derided. An inhabitant of Perugia was going along the streets, wrapped in thought and melancholy, and being met by someone who inquired the motive of his concern, replied that he owed money which he could not pay. The man started laughing and said, <laughs> Leave the anxiety to your creditor. Some Genoese of Pera, a Genoese district near Constantinople, went to town on business and, in consequence of a fray with some Greeks, had part of their number killed, others wounded. Justice was demanded on the murderers, and the emperor promised it should be promptly done. He then ordered that the Greeks, as a punishment for their offense, should have their beards shaven off, which is, by them, looked upon as an ignominious penalty. The Genoese magistrate, thinking he had been trifled with, promised the relatives of his countrymen that he would himself avenge the outrage. Somewhat later, the Genoese entered Constantinople and slew or wounded some Greeks. The emperor immediately lodged an energetic complaint with the magistrate of Pera and requested the punishment of the guilty parties. The magistrate assured it should be an exemplary one and on the appointed day had the murderers and their accomplices conveyed to the public square as if their heads were going to be cut off. The news of the execution had brought together a crowd of Greeks and the whole population of Pera in expectation of the capital punishment. The magistrate then Having prescribed silence through the public crier, ordered the backsides of all the culprits to be shaved, saying that the Genoese wore their beards not on their faces, but round their buttocks, and that by this shaving of faces and bottoms, the same penalty had been applied to the same offenses. During my stay in England, I was told an amusing sally of an Irishman, who was the captain of a merchantman. His ship was assailed at the sea by a violent storm, and the crew gave themselves up for lost. The captain made a vow that if he escaped from the shipwreck, he would offer up to the Virgin Mary, Mother of God a candle as high as his main mast. His mate blamed him for the rashness, since in the whole of England there wasn't enough wax to make such a candle with. Hold your peace, replied the captain, and let me promise the mother of God what I please, provided we get out of danger. When once we are safe, she will content herself with a penny candle. On the 1st of May, the Romans cook and eat in the morning various kinds of vegetables, which they call virtues. This custom was one day mentioned among friends 
in the presence of Francesco Lavegni, a Milanese. No wonder, he said laughing, the Romans should have degenerated from their forefathers, since every year they destroy their virtues by eating them. These are a collection of jokes written by Poggio Bracciolini. They were first printed in the 15th century in what has been considered the world's first joke book. However, these aren't the world's first recorded jokes. Obviously, some of the references here may not make a great deal of sense to some, like, for instance, the Genoese in Constantinople. In that joke, he is talking about the Italians who were allowed to live in Byzantine-controlled Constantinople, and, obviously, there were some problems between the local Greeks and the Italians. In fact, these jokes were collected just before the fall of the city to the Ottomans, and they were published when the city had changed hands. Otherwise, in the next section, you'll see that he makes jokes about people from all over Europe, like the Irish and the Romans. These people he met while touring Europe while in search of classical writings. He is, after all, quite a renaissance man, not just a comedian or a joker. During the war which the Florentines were waging against Pope Gregory, the Perugians sent ambassadors to Florence to ask for assistance. One of them, a doctor, began a long speech and said, Give us of your oil! Another, a jolly fellow, interrupted him. What about that oil? You ask for oil when it is soldiers we want. Do you forget we came here to ask for arms and not for oil? But those are the very words of scripture, replied the doctor. Most judicious indeed, was the retort. We are the foes of the church, and you invoke the assistance of holy writ. The man's drollery set everyone laughing. The doctor's useless flow of words was cut short, and business at once proceeded with. A rich man well wrapped up in warm clothing, was on his way to Bologna during winter time. While crossing the mountains, he fell in with a poor man who had nothing on but one jacket, worn threadbare, and wondering at the endurance of the man in such weather, with a heavy fall of snow and a biting wind, he asked him if he was not suffering from the cold. Not in the least, was the cheerful reply. How? retorted the rich man, amazed at the answer. I am freezing under my furs, and you, who are half naked, you do not feel the cold? If like myself, replied the rustic, you had your whole wardrobe on your back, you would not mind the cold either. A man, who had given his wife a valuable dress, complained that he never exercised his marital rights without it costing him more than a golden ducat each time. It is your fault, answered the wife. Why do you not, by frequent repetition, bring down the cost to one farthing? A Florentine, who thought himself a very clever fellow, was betrothed to the daughter of a widow. And being, as is usual, a frequent visitor at his wizard's house, one day, whilst the mother was away, took advantage of the girl. Her looks betrayed the thing to the mother, who scolded her bitterly for having disgraced herself, and told her that the marriage was anything but a certainty, since she would do all in her power to break it off. The young man came back as soon as his intended mother-in-law had gone out again. He found the girl in tears, inquired the reason, and was told that the mother meant to break off the match. And you? he asked. I wish to obey mamma. And thus the match was broken off. Some time afterwards, she took another husband, and her former love, another wife. She was present at his wedding, and the memory of the past brought a smile on their lips when they looked at each other. This did not escape the new bride's observation, and suspicious of something wrong, she asked her husband, in the night, the meaning of what she had noticed. He tried hard to evade an answer, but she forced him into relating the story and exposing his former mistress' silliness. 
Confound the hussy who was such a fool as to tell her mother of it, exclaimed the wife. What was the use of letting her know about your doings? Our valet slept more than a hundred times with me, without my ever mentioning one word about it to mamma. The husband remained silent. He felt he had been rewarded according to his deserts. In that section he talked about a war between the Florentines and the papacy. This is the War of the Eight Saints, which occurred at the end of the 14th century. Poggio himself was in fact a Florentine, who had many friends in high places, like Cosimo Medici, the ruler of Florence. But despite searching for classical texts, dining with the clergy and royals, he wasn't above dirty jokes. Some include mating sheep, the occasional fart joke, and the likes. And you'll see a couple more of them in the following section. A woman who, in consequence of a disease of the skin, had her hair shaved off, being called by a neighbor on some pressing business, went out and forgot to cover up her head. Seeing her in that state, the neighbor rated her for showing herself in public bold and uncomely. She then, in order to hide her head, pulled up her petticoats from behind and, wishing to conceal her boldness, disclosed her backside. People had a good laugh at the expense of the poor woman, who, in her anxiety to avoid a small breach of decorum, was guilty of such gross impropriety. Two Jews were on their way from Venice to Bologna. One of them fell sick and died. The survivor, anxious to bring the corpse back to Venice, which it was not lawful to do openly, cut it up into small pieces and put it with aromatics and honey into a small barrel. Once inside, it produced a most delightful flavor and he gave it to another Jew, who was going to Venice. This man, intending to reach Ferrara by canal, took it with him on the boat. And, as there was a crowd of passengers, a Florentine happened to take his seat close to the barrel. Night came. Attracted by the fragrancy and uh, suspecting that some dainty was stowed away there, the glutton stealthily began to taste the contents. He found them uh, luscious and reverted to them so frequently that he emptied the vessel. When the Jew was about to leave the boat in Ferrara, he took up his barrel and perceived that it was empty from its light weight. He screamed that he had been plundered of the corpse of his brother in Israel, and the Florentine thus became aware of being a Jew's tomb. A friend of ours at a party related that one night he had found gold in a dream. Mind, said someone, mind the same thing does not befall you that befell one of my neighbors whose gold was turned into muck. My neighbor dreamt that the devil had led him into a field to dig out gold. When he had found a good lot, the devil said, you are not allowed to carry the way now, but mark the place so you may find it again. The man inquired what sign he could use. Cuck here, replied the devil. It is the best way that nobody should suspect that there is gold here. The man thought that as a good plan and, awaking forthwith, became aware that he had abominably loosened his bowels in the bed. Rising amid the muck and stench to leave the house, he put on his cup, wherein the cat had just done its needs. Enraged at the horrible smell, he had to go and wash the filth off his head and hair. Thus, the golden dream had turned to third.